this isn't a story of the West. This is a story of Tibet. It's about one of their young boys, the Panchen Lama, and his abduction. This began a long time ago, when the Buddhists of Tibet discovered a system to identify their future religious leaders as young children. Believed to be reincarnations of former religious leaders, these children, at a very young age, are immersed in a rigorous 20-year education. And so it would have been for this boy, Gendon Cherki Nima, the 11th Panchen Lama. Known as the second most important religious figure in Tibet, he is the center of a swirling storm of international controversy. The type of cases we work on are criminal kidnapping cases where a child's gone over a period of years. And it doesn't matter whether it's in California or in another country. Abduction is abduction, child abuse is child abuse. January 29, 1989, the 10th Panchen Lama, Lapsang Trinli Cherki Galtsen, passes away in Shigatsi, Tibet. Upon the sudden death of the 10th Panchen Lama, the traditional identification process for the next Panchen Lama began. Almost immediately, the process veered wildly off course. The question, who holds the historic religious authority to identify the reincarnation of such an important spiritual figure? The Chinese government or the Dalai Lama of Tibet? At present, there are two answers. Two boys have been chosen. One by the Chinese government, the other by the Dalai Lama. The boy chosen by the Chinese government is not accepted by the Tibetan Buddhists. The boy identified by the Dalai Lama is reported to be under house arrest by the Chinese government. He, along with his parents, were last seen in May 1995, just days after the Dalai Lama publicly identified him. He was then six years old. Orville Schell, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley, a noted writer, China scholar. I kept him for over an hour, trying to tap into his understanding of Chinese politics and history, his perspective on Tibet. I wanted him to tell me that this Panchen Lama situation was going to turn out okay. He didn't. I think the issue of the Panchen Lama really centers around the question of control. Now, of course, the Communist Party has no authority in these matters. It's preposterous to think of them choosing, you know, through divination and dreams and oracles and whatever, you know, a reincarnation. But the question of control is paramount. 
early 1991. In separate searches, the Dalai Lama and the Chinese government begin to pursue the identification of the Panchen Lama. Wei Jing Sheng, democracy advocate. The only person I have ever met who has survived as much torture as Wei Jing Sheng was a Tibetan monk. His easy smile belied his damaged organs and steadfast determination. He spent 18 years in Chinese prisons for criticizing China's actions in Tibet and advocating democracy in China. There he sat. He did not look like an enemy of the state. Ti 他们从小进行教育、进行控制，将来这个班禅喇嘛长大了，很可能也在他们的控制之中。所以说，现在共产党的方法就是说，班禅喇嘛不管你选定哪一个，都在他的控制之中。March 21, 1991, the Chinese government is informed that the Dalai Lama wishes to assist in the search for the reincarnation of the Panchen Lama. China rejects this proposal three months later by saying that there is no need for outside interference. The Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama are Tibet's two highest lamas. Traditionally, the Dalai Lama is both the secular head of the country as well as the spiritual leader. He is believed to be the emanation of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion. The Panchen Lama or great scholar, plays primarily a religious role. He is believed to be an emanation of Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light. It's said the Panchen Lama is like the moon to the Dalai Lama's son. Tibetans explain that when one dies, the other helps find and identify the new incarnation. Sometimes the Panchen Lama is the spiritual father to a young Dalai Lama. At other times, he is the spiritual son. They guide each other from lifetime to lifetime. In the 15th century, the first Dalai Lama established a vibrant monastery called Tashilumpo in the Tibetan city of Shigatse. 200 years later, when the fifth Dalai Lama was a young boy, his spiritual upbringing was guided by the abbot of that same Tashilumpo monastery. History says that when the abbot died, the Dalai Lama gave him the monastery declaring that his teacher would reincarnate again and again, and each successor would be known as the holder of the Panchen Lama lineage. George Fernandez is a very confident man and one of the most recognized figures in Indian politics. Currently India's Minister of Defense, he's also known as a powerful labor leader. Once, he told me, he had the power to shut down the entire labor force in the city of Bombay for any purpose he thought fit. I believed him. If there are circumstances where uh, tomorrow a new uh, Dalai Lama has to be identified, and we have still not liberated Tibet, and the Tibetans are not in charge of their own affairs, then you can rest assured that the Chinese will identify Dalai Lama also. So the issue is much bigger than just looking at the Panchen Lama and where is he and how do we get him out. The issue is much bigger than that.
China has always been a society that has been governed with a very different notion of control than we are used to in a, in a democracy. They've not esteemed diversity, debate, pluralism, a loyal opposition. They don't believe that, that uh, contentious discussions lead to some sort of a, a compromise and some sort of a, a synthesis. They view that as centrifugal, as, uh, as divisive. They don't want anybody else, you know, having the authority to mandate anything of importance in religious or political matters in Tibet. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Panchen Lama identification team is made up of high-level lamas from the Tashi Lumpo Monastery. Their guidance comes in the form of visions that prophetically direct their search to the true reincarnation. Following these mystical signs, the lamas test the most likely candidates by asking them to identify personal objects owned by the previous Panchen Lama. Oracles are then consulted and divinations performed to reconfirm the final candidate. The Dalai Lama himself normally carries out these final steps. Houston Smith is known as the grandfather of the study of world religions. He grew up in China, the son of Methodist missionaries. The day after the communists took over their town, his parents were placed under house arrest for nine months. Eventually, they left China, as even walking down the street and saying hello to a friend would place that person under suspicion of collaborating with foreign imperialists. All religions, Judaism is uh, a little less clear on this, but all of the others uh, uh, affirm there is a spirit as well as a body. And they all hold that there is more to be done uh, in the afterlife. Now, in reincarnation, the view is that the that added work that needs to be done is done on this plane in a physical body. John Hume won the Nobel Peace Prize soon after this interview. He's been a moderate voice in the conflict in Northern Ireland for over 20 years and understands the passions which drive their struggle. In a characterization that might bring it home for the West, he suggested one could compare China and Tibet with England and Northern Ireland. Intolerance of difference goes to the heart of conflict everywhere in the world. And what people have to learn is that difference is natural. There's not two people in the whole world who are the same. The answer to difference is not to fight about it, it's to respect it. During the Reformation, when England colonized Ireland, the colonists were Protestant, the settlers, and the natives were Catholic. So from day one, the difference in religion had a much deeper significance because it went to identity as well, Britishness or Irishness. The unionist mindset, largely the Protestant people, is that the only way to protect themselves and their identity and remain separate is to hold all power in their own hands because they're a minority in Ireland and therefore give nothing to the other side so that the other side will never vote them out. But the net effect of that 
is to provide widespread discrimination. And in the end, that's bound to lead to conflict. Then on the other side in Ireland, the nationalist community has got a mindset that has to change as well. And it exists in many parts of the world, the territorial mindset. This is our land, this is our country. And the saying to the unionists, you unionists, Protestants are a minority and you can't stop us uniting. And my challenge to that mindset, and I grew up in the community of that mindset, is that it's people that have rights, not territory. Now we're a few minutes away from the beginning of these talks. Without people, any piece of earth is only a jungle. And I and some of my colleagues will be going into those talks. And when people are divided, it's agreement that's required. As I said, I think the opening days may be a bit bumpy while we get, or try to get, agreement. And that agreement should respect the differences and diversity and create the circumstances where both work together in their common interests. The people of Northern Ireland now have a stake and an ownership in these proceedings. And indeed, that's not just the sort of Tibet we want to create, or the sort of Ireland or Cyprus or Yugoslavia. It's the sort of world we want to create. Well, I mean, there really is a disconnect between what China is all about and what Tibet is all about. China really thought they were liberating Tibet overthrowing this old oppressive exploitative system that had serfs, had a theocratic structure on the top. Tibet didn't have a, a history of endless rebellions against the Tibetan religious establishment. People at every level, even though there were abuses, there was in, in, were inequities and there was exploitation, uh, people at each level felt a part of this uh, th this religious system, which they really didn't in China. And this was something China couldn't understand very well. They still saw liberation in the terms that were meaningful in China as relevant for Tibet. And thus, uh, it got to be forced upon Tibet in a way that I think China still incompletely understands. I mean, why the Tibetans weren't more receptive to the idea. The Chinese Communist People's Liberation Army, known as the PLA, overthrew Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government in October of 1949. That same year, the PLA called for the peaceful liberation of Tibet. Despite the objections of the Tibetan government in Lhasa, the Chinese armed forces invaded. Over the next several decades, this resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Tibetans who were killed in battle, executed, tortured in prison, committed suicide, or starved to death. With over 6,000 monasteries destroyed, with massive religious, social, and political displacement, the culture has been devastated. Well, I mean, it's very clear that if China wanted to settle the Tibet problem, they would win enormous uh, international uh, plaudits. But uh, this doesn't play in China because anybody who suggests a solution may seem to be selling out the motherland, selling out the reunification of China, giving a piece of it away. In 1959, the Dalai Lama, members of the Tibetan government, and thousands of Tibetans fled to India. Today, over 130,000 people are living in exile, scattered across the world. The Tibetans in Tibet face an ever-tightening situation. Their religious practice is strictly controlled. Massive resettlement campaigns by the Chinese are making Tibetans a minority in their own land. There exist language and cultural barriers to economic opportunities and a quality education. Half of the political prisoners are monks and nuns. Waving a Tibetan flag in public means years in prison. 
Many Tibetans continue to look to the Dalai Lama for both spiritual and political leadership, yet publicly displaying a picture of the Dalai Lama inside Tibet is outlawed. Persecution is like going in to the most inner resources of a human being. It's one person telling another person what you may or may not believe. Now that's just quite different from what you may or may not do. Ellie Wiesel, Nobel Peace Laureate. Holocaust survivor. Elie Wiesel objected to one of my questions. What happens when governments use persecution as a weapon? He took issue with the term weapon. Persecution, he said, is used to control, but not to kill. Weapons means killing. Leaning towards me, he shrugged his shoulders slightly and whispered, I'm simply sensitive to the word. Once upon a time, refugee meant somebody who had a refuge, found a place, a haven, where they could find refuge. Refugee today means somebody who has no home, no homeland, no security, no government to protect him or her. I think those governments who resent religion, they are afraid of religion, because religion may be, in their eyes, in their views, be seen as a counter-government or a parallel government. A religious person answers to God, not to the elected or non-elected official. Tibet is a tragedy. It's an insult to human decency. And the fact that the religious uh, community is being oppressed and persecuted is something that every single person in the world who has any religious faith and a religious feeling for, for people who have faith should speak up. Geshe Gyaltsen, director of the Tubden Darge Ling Monastery in Long Beach, California. After we finished the interview, I sat chatting with him. He's a man with a very warm heart. He asked me why I was there. Why was I really doing this project? Sometimes, Benji Lama is the teacher for the His Holiness. Dalai Lama, and uh, sometimes he's only Dalai Lama is the teacher for the Benchy Lamas. That's kind of the start point, teachers relations, very important relation. This was the Dalai Lama's fourth interview of the day. He had already taped The Larry King Show, The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and Radio Free Asia. Now it was our turn. Feeling the weight of the project as our time drew to a close, I found myself saying, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for an atheist communist government to select a Tibetan Buddhist religious leader. He just laughed and agreed it wasn't logical. Then he hinted, I should calm down and think clearly. I thought very seriously about the, the timing of announcement. The firstly, because the Benjamin Lama's reincarnation become clear uh, inside Tibet, uh, is inside Tibet, under Chinese control, so therefore, whether we like it or not, we have to deal, uh, we have to work through Chinese government. Then about to announce my uh, final sort of decision, I also informed the Chinese government. Uh, then it's an indication they are very furious. May 14, 1995. After completing the appropriate traditional Tibetan rituals, the Dalai Lama announces Gendon Cherki Nima as the reincarnation of the Panchen Lama. They do not I mean, accept, you see, uh, see, the 
any idea of rebirth. And in fact, they, they consider Tibetan Buddhism is very backward. It's worth it to eliminate. At the same time, <laughs> there are so much concern about the uh, reincarnation, uh, which very much as the spirit of religious belief. May 17, 1995. Xinhua, the official Chinese news agency, carries a scathing reaction and terms the Dalai Lama's action of identifying the Panchen Lama as illegal and accuses him of disregarding fixed historical conventions, undermining religious rituals. Now, this case, now they see, at least the local Chinese, they see clearly so long Tibetan religious faith remained there, so long Tibetan unique cult cultural heritage remained there, they see the threat of separation. May 18, 1995. The Chinese launched their campaign to denounce the Dalai Lama's declaration of the new Panchen Lama. Tourists in Shigatse report a sharp increase in troop activity. Now in future, they once the Chinese uh, government faced the reality, and according to the reality, some uh, reasonable or open discussions happen. Uh, suddenly, see, we can solve these, these problems. Mid-May 1995, Gendan Chirkinima, the young boy identified as the Panchen Lama by the Dalai Lama, is taken to China. The exact whereabouts of him and his family are unknown. Traditionally, uh, since Mao Zedong came to power, religion in China and Tibet is not viewed as a, as a favorable sort of phenomenon. It is considered to be reactionary, superstitious, basically obstructive of development. One could hardly imagine a less auspicious environment for religion of any kind to thrive. And for a society, its foundation was religion and religious practice. This was a mismatch from the beginning. Nobel Peace Laureate, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the Arch as he's known to his staff. We flew to South Africa for the interview. He was preparing to leave on a long trip and would be out of the public eye for three months. He gave us 22 minutes. If I could, I would include every second of those 22 minutes. We in South Africa are quite clear that we would not have succeeded, certainly not as comprehensively or as quickly without the support of the international community. We would like to see the problem resolved peacefully or reasonably peacefully. Um, and, 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 and that is why, you see, we call on the West for goodness sake, if you want nonviolence to succeed, then help these people. A green plastic water can for Chinese rubber plant. Thick plastic. 
I've been asked to speak here today on behalf of Tibetan youth across the world, but most especially on behalf of those Tibetans still inside of Tibet. Like all of you, I'm here today because I'm free to be. There's no one who can tell me where I can or cannot go, nor what I can or cannot do. For my people, the people of Tibet, freedom is a cherished thought, but it is only a thought. All of the things that they desire most are kept from them, and yet they have not given up hope for their freedom. It is this hope which the Chinese government fears most. They recognize both its power and its momentum, and they know that they have no control over it. They have seen what has taken place in countries like South Africa, Eastern Europe, and most recently, Indonesia. In these countries, it was the people's collective hope and fundamental belief in their freedom which toppled even the most powerful and ruthless regimes. These were clear victories for humanity which demonstrate that the same can and will be true for Tibet. But Tibetans cannot do this alone. We have to show them our support for their struggle. We have to show the world that young people believe in the ideals of nonviolence and compassion that the Tibetan culture is based on. Perhaps more than ever before, our world needs Tibet. In an age marked by increasing acts of brutality and violence, we need the principles on which this peaceful and compassionate culture is based. And perhaps more than ever before, the Tibetan people need you. They need your energies, they need your talents, they need your hope and your freedom to ensure that they are not forgotten. In his previous life, this young boy, Ling Rinpoche, was the senior tutor to the young Dalai Lama. He gave core Buddhist instruction to the young leader while they were still in Tibet. Now, as tradition dictates, it is Ling Rinpoche's turn to be the student and the Dalai Lama to be the teacher. It is his turn to receive the core teachings. And so it is with all high-level Tibetan reincarnations. The training, which lasts over 20 years, has at its center the transfer of knowledge from the recognized master to the younger, untrained student. It is this level of education that Gendon Cherki Nima is being denied. We have a tragedy in the making because um, if he does not receive the proper kind of spiritual philosophical education, he will not be equipped to either lead or to win the authority and respect that, that, that he would have to have in order to be a, a, even a spiritual leader. This isn't the first time the Panchen Lama has been held under house arrest by the Chinese government. The 10th Panchen Lama was also caught in the crossfire. He was once seen as a spokesperson for the Chinese government. Later, after writing criticisms of China's liberation of Tibet, he too was imprisoned and then placed under house arrest for a total of 14 years. His sudden mysterious death came after further criticisms of China's actions in Tibet and his public support of the Dalai Lama. His death still leaves many questions unanswered.
Jose Ramos Huerta will say what others won't. He has been in exile since 1975, since the colonization of East Timor by the Indonesian government. One in six East Timorese have died in this struggle. Not unlike Tibet, also one in six dead. China must be persuaded to release the child without harm expeditiously for its own sake, for its own credibility, when a permanent member of the Security Council engaged in this kind of extortion, kidnapping, coercion of a enormously important uh, symbol for an entire people, for an entire belief, not only Tibetans, but other Buddhists all over the world, I think it's very serious. Most colonial powers, most aggressors, know that to resolve an eminently political problem, you cannot resolve it by military means alone. So you try to drown the local population with uh, your numbers. In the case of East Timor, we have uh, today 200,000 Indonesian migrants there, out of a population of only 700,000. The strategy of the Indonesians is exactly as the Chinese in Tibet. This is also not the first time that the Chinese government has claimed the right to choose the High Lamas of Tibet. To validate their authority in this matter, the communist government cites a recommendation made in 1792 by the Manchu rulers to the Tibetan government. The Manchus suggested that in selecting High Lamas, the Tibetans should institute a lottery, which they referred to as the Golden Urn system. One name would be chosen and then forwarded to the Chinese central government for final approval. The Tibetans have asserted all along that a lottery system should be used when there are two very good candidates making it difficult to choose between them, and that they have their own lottery system which predates the Manchu recommendation. So, the question remains, whose authority reigns supreme? May 19, 1995. Posters rejecting the Beijing claim for use of the Golden Urn appear in Lhasa. May 20, 1995, Dharamsala responds to the Chinese government by explaining the historical conventions relating to the recognition of reincarnations. They urge Beijing not to politicize Tibet's spiritual traditions. May 21, 1995. Posters supporting the Dalai Lama selection for Panchen Lama appear in Shigatse. Ganda Sayagi, Tablam, Vishin, Samba, Nivhiji, Wane, Tablam, Jesse, Matuna. And the Europe Sagu, she made in Damed Mongu, Yese Sagu, and Yoga Yungu, but Nanshin Chigi, Esha Sagu, and Yoga Yoga, and she's doing it. So, this is all in the sunny, Yoga Chi Chung Sana. 
Kyalo Jayati, that she tabra. So that is not a majuncone, not a sevaci. One gets the crux of so much of ethnic conflict today, which includes religion. The Christian don't give a hoot about what the Muslims believe, and nor the Muslims about the Christians. It's not the doctrinal differences that uh, divide them. It's this heritage of memory of atrocities unavenged. Now, unless we can break through that, we go into living our lives and history by looking through the rearview mirror. And that's where forgiveness comes in. To forgive is not to condone what was done. What it means is not to allow uh, the past to dictate the future. Vicky Bourne, a member of Australia's parliament, felt very strongly about protecting people's right to their religious beliefs. She kept saying that even though the Tibetan monks and nuns look the same on the outside, the entire religion is being ring-backed. That's an Australian word for cutting around the base of a tree in order to kill it. In 1991, I was a member of an Australian human rights delegation that went to China and to Tibet. And we were looking at religious repression. And while there is in the Chinese constitution a freedom to worship, I think it's meant to mean a freedom to worship in your own home alone at night when nobody can see you. This isn't winning over the hearts or minds of the Tibetan people at all. The people realise what is happening. It's not as if they can fool the people who live in Tibet and are Tibetan Buddhists. In the end, the culture keeps going on, the religion keeps going on, it has to go underground. But then as soon as it becomes legal again, everybody finds out how many people have been practising this all along and you didn't know about it. The government didn't know about it. Or if they did, they tried to kill it off. It just won't work. Citizens of the People's Republic of China enjoy freedom of religious belief. The state protects normal religious activity. But what is defined and interpreted as normal is done so by Communist Party officials who are, by law, required to be atheist. Merritt Maguire, Nobel Peace Laureate from Northern Ireland. We were in the middle of a very personal story. She'd had a religious revelation about violence, its impact on the world. She went on to say how that has since shaped her life. We have to recognize the personal price that people pay when there is violence. I mean, my young sister, um, three of her Four children were killed, um, and the baby was only six weeks old, um, young Andrew, and her little boy, John, was two and a half, and her little daughter, Joanne, was eight years old, were all killed in a violent episode in Northern Ireland. And that is the personal price that people pay whenever there is violence. As Almighty God has called these children to himself, we commit their bodies to the... I have been deeply inspired myself by the Tibetan people because I, I feel that they have suffered so tremendously down through the last 50 years. Real repression, real hardship, real suffering. And yet they have spoken for non-violence and for love and forgiveness and for compassion. In a way, in a very strange, paradoxical way, governments, by repressing religion, give it fuller growth and fuller meaning and fuller purpose, and it flowers even more. 
The religious action is the essence of the Tibetan people, really it is. We want to have the happiness. That's why we need to have the cause of happiness. The cause of happiness is the spiritual action. <laughs> July 12, 1995, Chinese riot police interrupt a major religious ceremony at Tashi Lumpo Monastery. More than a hundred monks threaten to stage a demonstration against the Chinese government's forceful intervention in the selection of the new Panchen Lama. This Panchen Lama is very important to me. Because the Chinese government's way is to take these two children to control them, to do that kind of education. 最后完全改变这个小孩的思想。如果现在不赶紧给这两个小干小班禅喇嘛自由的话，那么时间长了恐怕就没有什么用了。这两个人可能都被他们给变成一个假的班禅喇嘛了。所以这个时间是非常重要的，时间非常重要。September 14, 1995, Tibet Information Network, a London-based news monitoring agency. Releases a list of 48 Tibetans who have been arrested by the Chinese police in connection with the Panchen Lama reincarnation dispute. I think part of the problem is now that it becomes even more intractable because there were so many mistakes made and such brutality and savagery committed in Tibet that to acknowledge the magnitude of this wrongdoing would be completely humiliating to the Chinese leadership. November 29, 1995. A contingent of high Chinese officials and Tibetan lamas gather in Lhasa to draw lots from the golden urn to select the Chinese Panchen Lama. The drawing results in the selection of a six-year-old boy from the Nagchu area in northern Tibet. You know, freedom is cheaper than oppression. It seems so obvious. I mean, in this country, they were spending so much money trying to hold people down. Now they are realizing, yes, in many ways, freedom is cheaper. The Chinese, they don't think it is uh, conceivable now. It's thinking the unthinkable. But one day they're going to have to sit down with the Tibetans. You don't negotiate with friends. You don't negotiate with people who hold the same views as you. I mean, you dialogue with your enemies. You don't make peace with your friends. I mean, you are, you are, you are already uh, uh, engaged in peace with your friends. You talk about peace with your enemy, the one you are fighting. It's over for him. And today, 
Mandela is not only a free man, he was the president of a free South Africa. I want to tell you about a Tibetan woman. She didn't get a chance to grow old because she was a freedom fighter and they killed her while she was still young. She was my aunt. It was real. And they said to me that before she was killed, her last words were, free it Tibet. Free Tibet. Free Tibet. Free Tibet. Free Tibet. I get calls all the time to, you know, to handle kidnap, uh, kidnap children. I sit there and look at the child and I, and I think about my own kids and what kind of life they have and what kind of life this child must be having and, and how truly they're suffering because they're not able to have a, quote, a normal life. So it's an unfortunate situation where the outside community for Tibet is the last bastion of support and is also an extraordinary irritant. September 1998, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights asked the whereabouts of the then nine-year-old Gendan Turki Nima. The government reply was, he is being held for his own protection. I had some fear. Uh, on his life. But then, fortunately, his name uh, become much, much publicized. So now, uh, I think as far as his life is concerned, I think now, okay, maybe, may not, may not have danger. So now, they, uh, my concern is his education, particularly Buddhist edu education. January 13, 1999, the U.S. State Department asked to see Gandon Chirki Nima. The Chinese government replied, the family does not want to be bothered. I think I was wrong, because this is not only a story of Tibet and one of their young boys. It is also a story of the world. If the wall can come down, if the world can see an end to apartheid in South Africa, if the Catholics and the Protestants of Northern Ireland can come to the peace table, then it is possible to find a solution to the crisis in Tibet. And for the Chinese government to release a young child. Do something now. Help, peace, justice, Democracy happen, they can happen. Current status. Gendan Cherki Nima is believed to be growing up under house arrest. To date, no one from the United Nations, Amnesty International, or any government has been able to see him. It is difficult to solve an issue like the Panchen Lama's detention through the political process alone. Individuals have a crucial role to play. Call, write, get involved. If you ever want to fly, Mohammed Drive, up in the sky. Twenty a 
I'm not scared, I'm out of here. 